Hi, I'm Dr. Neto, founder and CEO of Wella Health, where we're working on affordable access to healthcare using technology and alternative care pathways, microinsurance being central to our work. I'm delighted to be on a chat on InsurTech Business Series, where we talk about some of the stuff we're learning at Wella Health and how we can improve insurance adoption across Nigeria and Africa. Enjoy. Welcome to the InsurTech Business Series podcast. I am Fulimi. And I am Gamola. And together, we host the most exciting podcast on insurance and insurtech related topics in Africa. Stay tuned. And we're joined by one of the uh, pioneers within the InsurTech health tech space. We've had a conversation with him before, yes, in 2020. Uh, it was also uh, at our two conferences, InsurTech conferences, and he's been you know, a, a supporter of, of the work and been a part of the journey so far, really. And I mean, we must say thank you. Dr. Neto, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, always a pleasure to be here and uh, well done on the amazing work you've been doing over the last few years. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really, really appreciate the support. Um, so before we go into the conversation, how are you? How has it been for you? I know there have been a lot of travels, a lot of things, but personally, how has it been? Yes, it's, um, it's been a very interesting time, you know, filled with a lot of uh, events and activities. Um, I feel that the industry has come up uh, a lot more, you know, so there's a, a lot more interest. We've closed a number of, you know, really good partnerships, you know, we've grown adoption um, insurance companies are paying claims now. So things are, things are looking up. <laughs> things are looking up. Yeah. yeah. And, and not without its challenges, of course, you know, I think, um, you know, in Nigeria where we work macroeconomically, we've seen a lot of challenges, but I think even globally over the last, you know, 12 months, you know, things have been difficult. Inflation uh, has gone up, um, you know, costs of doing business along, you know, so many different dimensions are increasing. And um, so, you know, it's been a challenging last couple of years, but there's also been, you know, many good highlights. So, you know, excited to dig into some of them in this uh, chat. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, it, it was great that you mentioned uh Claims bit. I know that this was a central theme of our last conversation, and even at our first conference in 2020, right? <laughs> you were just dragging us left, mm-hmm. right, center, <laughs> you know, around the claim. But yeah, I'm just like you said. I mean, a lot of things has changed, and definitely technology innovation, you know, within the space. Looking at 2020 to date, I think it has it has um, facilitated a lot of these things. And I know that you play within the health space. And speaking specifically around technology and innovation, one of the things that you offer is uh, telemedicine, right? And telemedicine is, is, is not yet generally accepted, right? There are still divided opinions around it. Um, but I wanted to ask, right, because we see that you are facilitating a lot of things. How do we run telemedicine? and make it work, right? So I'm going to be drawing, dropping a lot of stats today, right? Uh, and uh, for this, uh, I was looking at Statista earlier, and, and they mentioned that the revenue for digital health is going to grow about like 26%, uh, up to $840 million US million by the end of 2023. Telemedicine will play a huge role in terms of getting health care to more people, especially in Nigeria. Well, how can we get it right? How are you doing it? Yes, thanks. So, you know, really good question. And I get this telemedicine question a fair bit because telemedicine has almost been the poster child, you know, for, you know, health technology um, in the last, you know, few years. And especially with COVID coming into play and in-person interactions reducing, again, telemedicine, you know, um, had a big opportunity. And we did see a lot of, you know, uptake in, in actual telemedicine adoption. But as the pandemic has waned and, you know, is almost gone, at least a lot of the responses and interventions are in place. What we've also seen is, you know, the optic in telemedicine um, adoption globally, this is, you know, has kind of come down to almost, you know, approximately near pre-pandemic levels. 
Um, and so, you know, starting to have people, you know, think again whether telemedicine is actually solving, you know, the right problems for people. Um, looking locally in Nigeria, you know, we do a fair bit of telemedicine. But my belief is that, you know, telemedicine is useful, but useful within a, a suite of services. And so, you know, providing telemedicine standalone, I think, you know, um, has its limitations. I think that the way people think about, you know, healthcare access is not just, you know, talking to a doctor on the phone but, or, or, you know, using video chats. I think they think of it as, you know, the, the symptoms they experience and the best route for them to get that care. And when they have a partner that is able to deliver care via a number of channels, then, you know, they're more likely to adopt that partner, not really the channel. Um, because, see, the first point of call, and we're seeing a number of, you know, um, health insurers doing this, is your front door can be a telemedicine service, you know. So you have an app where you talk to a doctor, and then the next step, so that, that interaction just doesn't end there. The next step is actually something that is in person. So it might be a medication pickup. It might be a lab test. It might be, you know, further assessment by a doctor. But that that whole, you know, end-to-end -end interaction can happen via the same, you know, whether it's partner or interface is really important. Um, and so that's where I think telemedicine really, you know, can play a role is that, it is one of a suite of services that people have access to and then they can choose to adopt it and they know there is a feel safe where they can fall back on if you know they don't get the full service from telemedicine so that's the way i think you know personally my thinking is evolving around it and even the industry is organizing around that idea so i just we don't want to piggyback on what you just said now because i'm currently in the uk and um, one of the areas that we've been working on recently has been around telemedicine and this is because there's been like a major strain on like the health sector for the uk right while i know that the acceptance level isn't that great in in nigeria or we haven't gotten to the point where we are able to optimize the use of telemedicine what would you say are like the biggest challenge in terms of um, ensuring that people, I mean, at the first point of call, tend to reach out using um, telemedicine before, you know, ultimately going to have like a face-to-face -face, um, visit or checkup um, at the hospital. Because I want to believe that this in a way will sort of reduce the strain on the infrastructure and also in terms of access to, you know, quality healthcare. Because anyone and everyone would just really want to go to the hospital first. Like that's the first point of contact. If, um, whether it's a minor or, you know, a major sickness, everybody just wants to have that face-to-face -face conversation. So how would you think, you know, people can encourage the use of telemedicine? So very true. It's, a lot of it is very habitual. And if you look at, you know, um, health systems that have been relatively successful with telemedicine adoption, you find that, you know, it's embedded into how they do usual and general, you know, practice. So I'm, I'm aware that in the NHS in Scotland, for instance, in many of the services there, they've had a steady uptake in telemedicine adoption, even pre-pandemic. And then when pandemic came, they saw a lot of growth and that growth is persistent. And that's because they were very much set up to take advantage of that. You know, they had the infrastructure in place. They had the awareness in place. They had a way to refer people to a telemedicine service if they went into their usual, you know, general practitioner. Um, and so it was really embedded in how they thought about, you know, delivering care. Um, and I think as well in, in systems where, you know, you can't get into a GP very easily, you know, it's not, it's not so much in Nigeria. Nigeria is very, it's relatively easy, relatively now, relatively easy to walk into, you know, a clinic and get an appointment or see a doctor or see somebody anyway. Um, it's not that easy in the NHS. I mean, I, I know a number of people that have moved and when I talk to them, they complain, say, I want to see a doctor. And they say, I should come back in a week or two weeks' time. <laughs> so, so it's very jarring for people. So in a system like that, you know, telemedicine provides a great you know, alternative. Because if you call to book an appointment, they say, okay, how about you use this telemedicine service? So you can see how that, you know, solves the problem. And if they have the infrastructure in place, they're promoting it, you know, you can see how that adoption works. In our own, you know, markets or in our own um, jurisdiction where you have that relative mm -hmm. ease of access, um, where you can walk in and just, you know, see, go to a clinic, as long as you have money in your pocket. I mean, this is a caveat, of course. If you have, you know, money in your pocket, you can, you know, walk into a clinic um, and relatively easily see a general practitioner. So in that instance, then I think it's it's always going to be challenging to get adoption because you've got to then try to convince, you know, the average clinic on the streets to turn people away when they present 
and turn them to a telemedicine service. I mean, you, you, you struggle to find any clinic or doctor that'd be willing to do that. But if the patient in front of him that's willing to pay, um, he's not going to turn them away. Whereas, you know, in the alternate example in the UK, for instance, that's what they do. So you can see how adoption, you know, is going to be different. So where we have that relative ease of access and where there isn't ease of access. So usually where you now have the queues are when you go to public hospitals. So when you go into see a specialist, for instance, or you go to a, you know, a, a public hospital where it's cheaper, then you have, you know, hordes and hordes of, of people just waiting. What is the incentive there for the, the doctor or the practitioner to then switch over to telemedicine? Um, I think it's very challenging, you know, it's limiting because you don't have the physical interaction. You have to, you know, wrangle with the, the devices, the internet, the voice, you know, like the, the experience isn't that ideal a lot of times. And it's just easier to just see your patients in clinic. Um, and you now ask yourself, what is the business model as well for the public institution for charging for that? You know, so it can be very, you know, difficult and complex um, and adoption can, you know, can be challenging. And so, I, I think that in the near future, anyway, you you will not see that significant adoption unless there's a huge awareness and huge push on a lot of people across the board to make it happen. Um, but I wonder whether that effort is better spent in other things, you know. Mm. So um, I'm I'm mm. I think, like I said, it's it's great as part of a suite of services, but I don't think it will become the bulk or the habits for people just because we still have that, you know. Access is still a problem and people like it. Yeah. I want to talk about like the um, cross functional activity, not, not cross functional, but cross border to start with. Um, what well, you mentioned about, you know, people having access back home um, in Nigeria. I mean, one of the major things that are, that are, you know shown over over a period of time, or that I've seen over a period of time, has been the fact that, say, for instance, um, people that are um, left or um, that have moved away from the country and are trying to, you know, then gain access back to maybe their um, previous doctors and they would want to access healthcare. But what I'm trying to push now is in terms of a better use of this platform and integrating them with the current infrastructure. So this is not just um, for maybe the African continent or for Nigeria alone, but then looking at it holistically from, you know, cross border. So um, somebody in the US who wanna have wants to have access to maybe somebody um say in Nigeria to you know the doctor in Nigeria. Um those are some of the um sort of use case, you know, that I'm trying to wrap my head around. So do you think that those are some of the possible adoption telemedicine? Because we're beginning to see that as well. But um again, like you said, I don't we've not seen like people fully embrace um, telemedicine. Yeah, so I think I think the challenge, the main challenge across border, you know, um, utilization is a regulatory bit, you know, because the fact that I'm licensed in Nigeria doesn't mean I'm licensed in the UK and vice versa, you know. So I think the licensing is a problem. And if you look at the US, where you know they have state licenses, what the telemedicine companies, you know, do is they actually go and get doctors in each state, or they have, you know, doctors that have licenses for each state, which adds a level of complexity. So I think the regulatory bit mm-hmm. makes that difficult. And even if you surmount that, there's just a you know market size and a market access access and awareness problem that I think is very challenging to to overcome, and it will be expensive to actually reach the kind of customers or, or clients that you need to make it you know worthwhile. So again, on paper it might make sense, but I think in practice it will be very challenging. Looking at it from the diaspora point of view, right, uh, and how they can help to facilitate. Um, access to quality and affordable care, even to their loved ones back home in Nigeria, right? This is one use case that I think that um, is underused or not very much exploited. What are your thoughts around creating solutions around people in the diaspora being able to buy healthcare cover for their loved ones here in Nigeria and scaling that really because yes we send money home for different reasons chief of it to be healthcare if that's accurate or not right but I think that being able to provide that direct healthcare cover so mama just needs to go into the hospital get treated and go home they don't need to make any payment that's one use case that I'm seeing, but from your point of view, from your experience, what do you think um, about this? The diaspora opportunity is becoming more and more apparent to me. And 
in Nigeria, you know, in the first quarter of the year, there was a huge problem around cash availability because the central bank, you know, tried its demonetization. And we saw people really struggle to get access to cash. You know, people had really poor health experiences. And in fact, there were some deaths as a result of a cash shortage. And I was chatting to a number of, you know, friends abroad, and, you know, they were talking of how there's no point even sending money to Nigeria because when they send money, their families, you know, can't use it. And it got me thinking that actually, you know, Wella Health is set up to enable that family member who they need to access healthcare, access that healthcare without the need for cash at the point of care. So, you know, rather than, you know, having their family member, you know, take that money, remittance out as cash and pay, say, doctor or buy drugs in pharmacy, we can facilitate that and we can take the payment, you know, from the, the family member in the diaspora. And so that got us, you know, thinking and, you know, we've recently launched a product around that. Um, but then when I looked at the numbers, it's actually pretty impressive depending on, on who you believe, of course. But, you know, the estimates from the United Nations that, you know, Nigerians send about $23 billion home annually. And, I mean, that's as much as we, that's like our second, you know, FDI earner, yeah. you know. We earn slightly more from oil. So, mm-hmm. as it turns out, Nigeria's biggest export is its people. Um, you know, so a lot of money is sent back. And if you look at um, Nigeria Bureau of Statistics, you know, they, they do these surveys. And about 5% of... Um, of remittances is spent on healthcare. And so, and so when you do the numbers, it's about a billion dollars a year that is spent on healthcare from people in the diaspora. So that's a massive market opportunity. And it's apparent to me that, you know, there, there, there needs to be a concerted and, you know, defined efforts to try and organize some of that capital to just improve healthcare access in Nigeria. So that's what we're working on. So I'm a big believer that you know what, the diaspora is actually a good market to help them you know, organize their healthcare spending so that people back home really get good access to quality. Mm, definitely uh, interesting. And, and I like the point that you made around intentionally organizing that to make it work. Uh, because yes, I know that there are a number of players trying things in that space, uh, well health inclusive, but how can we have a conscious and dedicated effort towards making it work? I, I want us to go back a bit, right? From our previous conversation, the goal for Wella Health is to solve the challenge of out-of-pocket expenditure. Mm-hmm. And this is estimated to be about $7 billion being spent. How has that journey been for Wella Health? Well, we don't have $7 billion yet in our <laughs> <laughs> If that's what you're asking. <laughs> um, I mean, I've always known that it's a long-term journey because the biggest challenges, and we, we knew this early on, the biggest challenges we face are around education and trust. Um, and so the fact that the market exists or people are spending money doesn't mean they'll spend it with you. Because first of all, you know, who are you? Um, why would they give you money? Because we know the Nigerian society is very low trust and low integrity, unfortunately. So trust is a huge barrier to overcome and it's expensive to overcome. Uh, related to that, of course, is education. Is, you know, educating people that, you know, this out-of-pocket expenditure that you have, there are more efficient ways to spend it. Um, and that also takes a good bit of work because, I mean, as we know, the trust for and an understanding of insurance in Nigeria, you know, isn't really that high. And so you have to then spend a good bit of time and effort, you know, educating people. And so I just, you know, I've always known that it would take a bit of time and it'd also be expensive. Um, what I think the industry hasn't been great at, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't feel like there's been a concerted effort to build that trust and education across the board in the market. I think that, you know, insurers and insurtechs and everybody in the space should come together and really, you know, work on improving the general awareness and trust. And the idea that, um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, we need to subscribe to that so that we don't have all these, you know, pockets of, you know, um, energies and work going on. Um, Yes, they can, but, you know, can we, you know, collaborate a bit more on a high level to really fund, you know, huge awareness campaigns huge marketing campaigns that, you know, lets people know and understand that uh, insurance is the way to go, not just for healthcare, but I think across the board, um, build some of that trust. And then from there, when, you know, the market is a, a lot bigger, there's more awareness, you know, the individual companies can come in and maybe start competing. But I think there's a lot of work still to be done to build that education and trust. Hey, this is Brian Falchuk from Boston, Massachusetts in the United States of America. I want to give a shout out to the InsureTech business series, Falumi and Damala. What you are doing 
to help move the industry forward in the African continent, but also more broadly for the industry at large is so incredibly important. As I think about the future of our industry, it's conversations like the ones you're having that will help us move forward. So congratulations on the success of the show. Please keep at it. Again, we've always had um, conversations around communication, on marketing, advertising, the awareness that you just talked about. But from some of the market um, surveys that's been done and um, some of the interactions that we've had with people that are in the non-insurance sector had been the fact that there's still that trust issue um, that they can't give their money to to an insurance person because they feel that the money is gone or that they would not be able to utilize the money. So do you think it's, it's a point of awareness now or it would be a point of actually changing the direction of how we communicate to the people that we're trying to reach? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work on the how, you know. Um, I think, so for instance, you know, this is why I've always, you know, spoken about paying claims in industry because actually the, the best story you can tell about insurance is to show people that it works. You know, we can talk from now till the cows come home, but if we don't have lots of people that are saying, yes, yeah, so I used insurance, so when I went to claim, oh, they paid me, they didn't stress me, oh, you know, like that's that's the the, the way, that's the, you know, the proof of the pudding. So I, I think that, you know, we haven't done a great job at, you know, talking about the success of insurance in people's lives. You know, life insurance, for instance, I mean, the difference that makes to somebody, if a, if a, I mean, a, a great story would be, you know, a, a stay-at-home mom, for instance, or, you know, a, a housewife with three kids, you know, her husband is, a, is, is well off, he's providing for the family and, you know, everything is going well and he dies suddenly. We know how disastrous that can be. That can push a family into poverty. But if life insurance pays out, that makes a massive difference. Have you, have you ever heard a story like that on TV anywhere? No, not, not exactly. No, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it happens. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure it happens. It, well, not all the time, but I'm pretty sure there's at least one person in Nigeria that has happened to. But nobody has put, yeah, nobody has put that widow on TV to tell her story. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that, that there's a lot, lot also to it, right? Because um, that widow, for example, doesn't want to be out there so that family members will not come and meet her she now has money. <laughs> well, I mean, you won't say that you paid her 20 million naira, you know? No, but, but, but then a lot of people are quite aggressive when it comes to testimonial. In fact, I saw um, a post recently on Twitter saying that um, everybody complains that they don't trust insurance, but when they pay claims, there's nobody in Nigeria that would come forward to say, I've been paid claims, so I have money now. But, but before then, you just hear a lot of you know comments on Twitter say, insurance companies are dubious. And when people finally get their claims paid, it, it then, it, it then, it then go mute. We don't hear these things anymore. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you're right. And we've seen that ourselves, you know, but we actively ask people. I wonder how many insurance, insurance companies mm. actively do this. I, I mean, the truth is, it's a game of yeah. numbers. If you ask everybody, one person will mm. eventually agree. That's just the way. Mm. But if you don't ask, if you ask one person and they say, no, I say, oh, we're not going to do it, then we're never going to know. I think that as a matter mm. of course, everybody gets a claim paid out, should be asked, would you be willing to do this for us? And honestly, you ask 100 people, you yeah. get So, so, so I, I'm wondering, can, can partnerships work and so partnerships in the sense that so for example insurers are partnering with Weller Health right so Weller Health is tech focused and they are customer facing and they are able to get these testimonials for example provide that kind of guidance to people okay this is what insurance does this is what uh, they can benefit from it right can partnerships work in that light because maybe the insurance companies are not equipped today to do all of that but maybe extending uh, the abilities through some of these kind of partnerships perhaps can be a, a way. Oh, absolutely. You know, but I, I haven't, I mean, I haven't, uh, no insurance company has come to me and said, please give us, you know, two or three people that will come put mm-hmm. on a billboard that says, you know, I paid <laughs> my claim, go and, you know, get insurance. So, so we still have to do that work and then go and, you know, sell it to the insurance companies that, you know, this is the, the I, I think the, the strategy has to also be, there has to be a belief in that strategy from mm. the insurance company so that we are working together so that, you know, it's almost like the marketing from there says, you know what, this is a, a definite mm. strategy. We already have the product. We just need the people to put on them. Then it makes life easy for me when I go to find the person. 
as opposed to going to find that person to tell a story and then I have to still pitch that story then to insurance company. You know, like life is hard for everybody. We are also <laughs> trying to make ends meet. Yes. You get. Mm. Uh-huh. So, so I think that, you know, insurance companies with big budgets should have this as a marketing strategy and then, you know, approach us, their partners to say, you know, listen, find two or three people for us. We can tell a good story, have a campaign, put it on billboards, put it on TV, put it on radio. Honestly, do that a couple of times. And now we have a reference point because when mm-hmm. we go to sell, what I say is, ah, you mm-hmm. don't see that advert. Look at that advert. Mm-hmm. Ah, insurance, they pay. Oh, insurance, pays. you know, like there's no reference point. And people tell us this. We have, you know, hundreds of agents in the market. People say, I'm not seeing you around now. We don't see you. Know, we don't have a reference point for you. I would like my agents to be able to say, look outside that market, see that billboard. That's our, you know, our partner that paid that claim. I can tell you mm. who we'll pay your claim. You get so so I think that you know marketing teams within insurance companies should look at this seriously and see, you know, how do we tell those stories that make people believe that mm. these things happen? Okay, so yeah. um for the marketing, I think individually, um each insurance company or some insurance company tries to at least um change the narrative. Well, like you mentioned earlier in this um, session, was the fact that we all need to come together and do that because it doesn't seem like the weight one man is carrying or one insurance company is carrying is actually changing the narrative. It just seems mm-hmm. like people just know that insurance company and say, oh, okay, they've come with their advert again. But I mean, if it comes, you know, from a wider range, like with collaborative efforts from, you know, different parts of um, the insurance industry, I think that that would, you know, sort of cost like a major impact. Then, you know, just one person trying as much as possible to uh, maybe create as many advertisements as they can or marketing campaign and try to see how they can, you know, change the narrative. But then, say, for instance, if it was Axa Mansa, it's, it's still just going to be Axa Mansa. It's not going to yeah. be that the industry as, you know, a whole um, sort of changes that narrative in Nigeria. I want us to move a bit away from communication um, in terms of claims payments. Do, do you also see a challenge with the fact that people are not willing to pay for insurance because there's no flexibility in payments? I know that that's what Wella Health does, you know, by helping to unbundle products. Say, for instance, now we're starting with the malaria insurance, you know, just making it affordable for like the average person on the street. Do you think that that has been effective in terms of conversion and, you know, bringing people into the insurance space? Um, the, my, my thinking is evolving and it's still an evolving story. We're still collecting data on this. I, I think that, to be honest, it, it is challenging to get people to part with, you know, a regular premium payment without getting a service in return regularly, you know, um, the market hasn't evolved yet to that place. And so I think that, you know, unbundling, unbundling is, certainly a, a, is certainly one way to start that conversation. Unbundling also in a way that they are able to experience something outside of, say, a claim, right? So, I mean, the perfect insurable, you know, episode is something that is rare, but is significant, right? So, I mean, that's why life is a great product, at least from the insurance point of view. But you you only lose your life once or, you know, whoever whoever has that, uh, you know, product only loses their life once and, you know, it may not happen for years, it may not happen at all. And we know that a lot of times, actually, the, the, the most life products that we sell in the industry are either mandatory products or embedded products, you know, so things like credit life or group life, Mm -hmm. you know, voluntary life. I don't know that uh, I've not seen the data, but I'd be very surprised if it's up to, you know, 30% of premiums. Do do you know what it is at all? Yeah, for, um, I mean, I I wouldn't necessarily say voluntary. Um, I would say it's a mixture because again, what we do back home is it's a mixture of investment in voluntary life so that people don't come back and say, I did not die. I did not get my money back. So we, we don't try to do voluntary life like uh, expressively. It has to come with something, which is largely investment. There you go. Okay, so making the point exactly that the idea that I pay a premium and I didn't uh, suffer the event and I'm getting nothing back, uh, no, this is a scam. And so I think that's really where, you know, the industry needs to figure a way to serve people, um, but still obviously, you know, make it a profitable venture for the, for the companies. And so I think unbundling is one way so that people have kind of smaller events um, that potentially they're more likely to claim from. But then going beyond that is thinking about how do we then embed it into something else? I think the, the story about embedding is still evolving, but I think that ultimately that's what we as an industry have to figure out is how do we embed insurance so that 
the 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 service it's embedded with becomes the regular experience mm. right and then the insurance is now the extra benefits mm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, embedded insurance, I think, would, would shape the future. Um, it's just too difficult to damage. Let me jump in. It's, it's so, I, when we say embedded, mm-hmm. I, I don't like the reason I'd like to really say and you know um, pin my um, my flag to embedded is that mm-hmm. it's it's one thing to embed, it's another thing to be successful with an embed. Okay. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so the, the devil is in detail. So not okay. just embedding for the sake of embedding, but thinking deeply about the value. Okay of what it is that insurance brings to that product. product yeah. I find that, because we've done this ourselves and, you know, have learned is that it's one thing to just embed and say, well, if you buy this and you get insurance, mm. but it, how does that play in the mind of the customer? Mm-hmm. You, are they looking at the product as one in that the the experience from this product is part of the experience of insurance? Mm. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. I think that sometimes they're very removed. For example, if we embed insurance with um, buying a bag of flour, okay, how do we get people to understand or feel that every time they use their flour to bake bread, they are consuming their insurance? Mm. They're not consuming flour. They're not consuming bread. They're consuming insurance. Mm. So I think that's where the embedding has to get to so that it now looks like actually the flour is part of the insurance. Mm. Not that I bought flour and then insurance is something on the side. Mm-hmm. So like a real and true deep embed. I don't mm. think that we as industry have figured that out. I think all of our embeds so far are very superficial, at least in my experience. Mm. I, I think it's a journey, right? And I mean, all mm. of these things really just pumped up post-COVID. I, honestly, the, the industry has grown. Um, the space has grown. Um, embedded insurance. We see a lot of people playing within that space. We've seen a lot of partnerships, insurtechs and insurers doing things uh, differently and seeing how basically train things on the wall and and seeing which which sticks. Okay. Uh, yes. So so it's, it's interesting and and it would be interesting to hear you know about some of the partnerships that uh, you know Wella Health has ha- has done in the, in the at least since when. When we last spoke, uh, I know that you've, you've done a lot of partnerships. There was Bima Lab as well since since then. Uh, I mean, just just tell us. Yes, so partnerships have done a number. So I think probably the biggest one is the one with Stambik Bank. So we've got a, Stam- a partnership with Stambik where, you know, when you sign on to their mobile money wallet, you get, uh, you know, health insurance uh, benefits. Um, and we're able to upsell, you know, people on that uh, channel or via that channel. We also have a partnership with Verve. So with a Verve card, you can get, you know, an insurance plan at a significant discounts um, when you buy using your Verve card. So we have those two. Those two are in really big partnerships that took a lot of efforts to, you know, put through. And we're seeing, you know, decent uptick following those partnerships. But still a lot more work to be done. I think that, you know, signing the partnership is one is is one hard bit. Getting the partnership to work is the second hard bit. As, you know, just as hard, if not harder than the initial partnership. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we've also had, you know, a couple of partnerships with MFIs. I think, you know, MFIs provide a good opportunity. So yeah. microfinance institutions provide a good opportunity to, you know, really get things going. And a few fintech apps. So, you know, we've got this partnership with Repright, like a new bank and okay. savings app where, you know, when you open an account, you know, they actually, you know, provide you with uh, some of our health benefits. And then finally, I think we just launched this with Kipa. Kipa is a... Um, they're a fintech that provides uh, merchants tools and financing for, you know, small mm. uh, merchants. So mm. people that, you know, buy, you know, fast moving consumer goods. Mm. Um, these guys provide them with, you know, invoicing, POS, those types of mm. services. And then we've embedded some insurance into them. So we've got 3,000 of their uh, merchants okay. using our insurance plans and with the goal to, you know, have uh, way more. So I think, you know, some progress, um, but still a lot more work to be done. So for me, I'm looking at the the SME space, the gig worker space, right? How do we get these guys to buy insurance? Not because we want to sell insurance, but they actually need insurance, need right? It, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> so it was interesting when when, when you talked about uh, that partnership. Um, I mean, what, what are your thoughts around? I mean, what we need to do in order to better serve this market? Is it flexible premium, flexible product? Or you know, really just designing something different because it's a new, it's, it's, it's a it's a different space, different way of life, different thinking, different mindset. The, the pocket uh, strength also is not the same with the one that was used to design insurance products that exist today.
Hi, everybody. My name is Bent, and I'm the founder and CEO of MTech, and we are based in Kenya. I am very passionate about the disruption of the insurtech space, and together with our model MTech, we are actually serving insurance platform and also white labor solutions for the industry. Please keep on listening to InsurTech Business Series podcast, and I hope to see all of you at the conference in December. Absolutely. And I think you've hit the nail on the head is that, you know, for these types of, you know, new opportunities is to really put on a, you know, customer discovery and product hat and go into the trenches and, you know, work with, you know, the partners and the actual people there to figure out what are the risks they are most worried about. I, I think that's the key thing. Um, people, people don't buy insurance, right? They buy that, you know, risk protection, I guess, is that, okay, is it fire? Is it, you know, uh, theft? Is it, you know, what is it? Loss of income? You know, what is it that I'm most concerned about as a small, you know, merchant, small business owner? And I think understanding that and understanding how they think about it, understanding their own cash flow, so you also understand how to collect payments, and then designing products and premium collection around that process. I don't think that, you know, we've done the work. I mean, I even say this ourselves, you know, we've obviously done some partnerships there, but I don't think that we have the best product yet. What we've been doing is shoehorning our current products into that space. But I think that the real, you know, winners there will be people that, you know, really, you know, put on their t-shirt and jeans, enter the market, sweat a bit with these guys, understand what they're going through, and then come and design very good products that speak to them. And then you'll see the uptake will be significant. I think that actually the biggest opportunities around this kind of small business insurance because they literally have they have, there's mm. no insurance you know we work with 2000 mm. you know, small businesses and we've done we've done the surveys okay. they have no insurance and they have significant risks you know we've got people with inventory of you know two yeah. five ten million naira and there's zero insurance mm. there you know so i think mm. it's a big opportunity i don't know that anybody's really focused on it yet mm. i think Partnerships again. <laughs> I mean, I, I, maybe because I, I work within partnerships, I'm a big proponent for that, right? So I think that partnerships can definitely extend the reach of insurance companies, right? Working with the likes of, you know, Wella Health to reach markets that they've not been able to. And beyond just providing in the current insurance products, how can they work with those partners, for example, to design? New products. Yes, right. I think yes. it is. But I think I think I think Dami. I think the problem with um the partnerships is the partnerships sometimes are arms length partnerships. Mm. Mm. I think the way that I mean you work in partnerships. I think the way that partnerships really work is if you enter the streets with me. Mm. I think sometimes it's too abstract because when we try to have this conversation and describe things, it doesn't really hit home. But you know, enter the streets with me for a few days, it, it will click instantly. Mm. Like aha, okay, I see where you're coming from. And then you can take that first-hand learning to go and, you know, figure out how to put it within the, you know, the constraints, of course, that you have in the insurance side. But I think that, you know, it's not enough to just, you know, do Zoom calls, have meetings in air-conditioned offices and talk about partnerships. <laughs> I think the partnership is, bros, come with me, make we enter markets. Let's see how this thing is working. You know, not to sell, mm, but to really understand. understand. Mm. Yes. And when we understand, then we can now build the right products for people. Mm. Okay. I, I, before we start talking about, you know, building product, um, do you think that, I mean, judging by the fact that you said now that <laughs> partnership is practiced in arm's length, do you, do you think that it, it, this might be, um, I mean, before we put the product out, we might have to reevaluate the infrastructure and, you know, flexibility of having to um, remove out some of our business um, um, strategy to fit into the current market changes. I mean, technology is changing, people are, consumer behavior is changing, you know, some of the market findings that you currently have as well, I'm sure they were really not there before. And then, you know, because it had evolved over time, but, but then we still have infrastructures in place that are they catering to the traditional or previous ways of um, insurance. Do, do you think that this might be like the um, first aspects to review before we then start to design products that would then that would be best fitted um, for this market segment? So I think it's a bit of chicken and egg. You know, I think that it's hard to know, you know, how you're redesigning your existing systems if you don't go out and, you know, find out what you need to redesign it for. But then again, you know, if you don't redesign, maybe you, you can't really go out and do it the right way. So I think on a level, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there. But I would say that, you know, going out and figuring out what it is that's out there is probably the way to go to inform 
the changes we need to make. Because I think there are a lot of changes we need to make. I think, you know, insurance, and I've said this a number of times, has been very much built in Nigeria for the big corporates, you know? Mm-hmm. That's traditionally where, you know, insurance companies have made their money. And so it's a very different way of thinking when you're trying to do kind of small businesses, you know, because with your big corporates, you know, you wear your suit and tie, get into a condition. With, this, with small businesses, you wear your T-shirt and jeans and you go and sweat in the markets. So uh, the people you hired for the AC and suits is not the same people that you hire for, you know, sweat on the streets. Um, and also it takes that bit of time, you know, with one, you know, big business, you close, you know, it's what's a hundred million naira in premium, you know, everybody's happy, the bonuses are good. But with a small business, you know, to get a hundred million naira in premium, you know, can take a bit of work. But once you get it right, that grows almost indefinitely to, you know, billions of naira in, in premium. So I think, again, it's a strategy thing. Like we said, with marketing and the storytelling, it has to be strategy, but also with this product um, and market development, there also has to be strategy from the top that says, we believe that the future is in small businesses. We know that's where the opportunity and market is. So we're going to do the work and make the investment to figure it out, you know, long term. So I think when the insurance companies have that as central to their strategies, then perhaps they'll start investing long term in the work that needs to be done to get us to improving their systems for, you know, making this work. Uh, absolutely. What does the future hold for Wella Health? And then also like all the insurance innovation and technology space. Yeah, so I'm I'm very bullish. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, so by definition, I'm very, <laughs> you know, if I if I was optimistic, I wouldn't start a business. Yeah. So I'm very bullish. I I think that the only way is up, and that's the advantage, I guess, of you know being in a in a in a market where the penetration is low. It means that we can only get better, and I think that the ingredients are coming into place. What I just wish is there should be a bit more acceleration a bit more understanding that we are early days. And so, you know, things will not be right. You know, some of the numbers will not make sense. Some of the things will not add up. But believing that if we are to make the progress we need to make, we need to be patient and, you know, invest. So I'm very optimistic. Like I said, I think that lots of opportunity, there's more capital coming in. There's a good bit of startups around. The enterprises as well are open to partnerships. You know, we've seen, like you said, Airtel and AXA have done some things together. We've done something with uh, Stanbic. I hear MTN are, you know, coming into the space, you know, so there's a lot going on and, you know, I'm very excited, you know, to have some more of this, uh, you know, actually crystallize into real progress. Yeah. And, and you want uh, Wella Health to be in the middle of it. Uh, maybe. Oh, leverage. absolutely. As far as healthcare goes, <laughs> yes. You know, I think, I mean, I think we're not to toot our own, but we're the best partners as far as, you know, delivering healthcare services really affordably goes. We work with over 30 partners, mm. you know, we manage tens of thousands of patients every month. Mm. We have a lot of experience. We've built really great technology, mm. you know, so I think we're the partner of choice as far as healthcare goes. Um, so use Wella Health. <laughs> 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 okay, I think before we let you go, three questions that we need to ask. You know that there's, um, we would like to assume that there's currently technology disruption, but we just wanted to know what your advice would be, especially now, um, it hasn't really, you know, been disruptive in the African continent. But what would you say about, you know, um, using that to the advantage of a majority of the health sectors or infrastructure back home? Yes. So great question. And um, so first of all, I don't, I don't use the word disruption, actually, when it comes to, you know, Africa. And the reason is, is that there's nothing to disrupt. <laughs> You know, what, what we're battling with, and if you look at you know, the, the originator of that, uh, you know, idea of disruption, Professor Christensen, and he actually wrote a book focused on, you know, markets like Africa, and, and he talks of non-consumption, right? Mm. He talks of market creation. Yeah. So actually, that is what technology affords us in emerging economies that really haven't been participating in markets like this, is with technology, it reduces the barrier and cost for creating markets and for actually, you know, helping people pull in products into their lives. And so now, for instance, you know, something like over 90% of, you know, our customers never had insurance before. And in fact, you know, in that book on, you know, market creation, that is um, the prosperity paradox, you know, micro-insure is a, is a specific example they use um, on how, you know, a market creating innovation using technology can, you know, enable people to pull in products that make a difference to their lives. So I think the model is really, using technology to create markets and using business models based on technology to create new markets that can really, you know, um, revolutionize access. Protection gap across the world. I was looking at one of the posts from Simon Torrance recently, and he puts that at about $7 trillion. And if you look at Africa, insurance penetration is 
about 3%. In Nigeria, it's less than 1%, maybe around 0.5% or 0.4%, whoever is counting. So yes, the opportunity is there, the gap is there. How are we using technology, innovation to remodel our products and how we view customers and better serve them? It's an interesting time. We are super excited about what's happening within the space. Yes, it's early days. Uh, we are growing. Uh, but again, the idea around our podcasts, our webinars, conferences as well is right. how can we learn from others and also take those learnings to build what we are building, right? So we don't repeat their own mistakes. Also understanding that the African market is peculiar. It's, it's different. I know that recently you opened up shop in, in a quiet bomb. What's happening there? What should we be expecting next? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that that um, is twofold um, strategy-wise. One mm. is, you know, working with state governments. So we wanted to work with a progressive, you know, state government that's looking at health insurance, in particular adoption. And you know, Nigeria recently passed, so it's probably a year now, so it's no longer that, no longer that recent, but a year ago, Nigeria passed a new uh, health insurance act, and that act put state health insurance schemes at the core of how health is going to be delivered. And so that office in 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 um, in a quite some states um, helps us to you know start to do state health insurance work across the south south and even the south. Okay. Um, that was okay. you know the strategy there. So you see us you know a lot more work with the government. And the second thing was really actually helping us to grow out our customer service um, operation. So we found that okay. uh, growing, you know, a lot of uh, people. And as you know, you know, Abuja and Lagos can be quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to, to keep our costs low, um, you know, we thought, you know, that would be a, a great second, uh, you know, office location for us. So those are, the, those are the two things that led us to, you know, to do that. And surprisingly, actually, uh, part of the reason why we you know, chose Aquaibum, I coincidentally am from there, but that's not the reason. <laughs> coincidentally? Coincidentally. Okay. <laughs> you know, seriously. But the reason is Aquaibum is our most successful state, actually. Wow, okay. Yes, you know, we mm. had quite a lot of, lot of interest there and, you know, did a lot of, uh, you know, good numbers in Aquaibum states. And we had mm. some good people there as well that we could build our office on top of. So that's mm. actually the reason that we went there in the end. Mm, okay, I mean, it's interesting you said that because a lot of people are targeting, okay, Lagos, Lagos, maybe Ogun or Ibadan, but well, in the West, right, uh, mm-hmm. you say you're doing stuff at a fire bomb. Because again, Nigeria is huge, right? The opportunity yeah. is Nigeria, not Lagos. Perhaps maybe exactly. it's, it's, it's the way that we are looking at it as well, because those in the South, in the North, they actually need these services. Perhaps Absolutely. we are not... So, it's, so, so in terms of, of of the success in that space, is it a thing of culture? Is it uh, language? So, yeah, so I, very good point. I I think there's there's a number of you know reasons. Um, I mean, culture, of course, being one of them. For instance, in the north, you struggle to sell insurance if you go to the north because of the culture there. But I think that very simply, you know, without kind of doing too much of an analysis, it's actually cheaper. Because if you think about it, the noise in Lagos, for you to cut through that noise, for anybody to pay attention to you, it's so challenging. If I want to buy a spot on radio, you can imagine how much it cost me. If I want to buy a billboard, you know, it's significant again. Whereas I can go to a you know, smaller state somewhere in the south, south, southeast, even in the north central, and, you know, buy out, you know, all the billboards in the town for less than with the cost of one billboard in Lagos. <laughs> Yeah, most of my yeah. plans are the same. You know what I mean? So, and I'm doing low cost plans. So why would I go spend a lot of money buying, you know, um, ads or mm. get a share of mine mm. in Lagos and Abuja when I can go, you know, for a fraction of the cost, get share of mine in a smaller mm. state and still, you know, do quite well. So especially like a small company like ours, you know, starting mm. off with something that's a bit challenging, the smaller states can be a good ground, mm. a better place for us to experiment. And then when we are successful, we can now come to Lagos <laughs> and start to fight with the bigger brands. <laughs> Thank you for your good work and also for coming on our podcast. I mean, it's been an interesting conversation, especially around insurance penetration, telemedicine, as well as the infrastructures that we need to put in place to ensure that we are able to get this product to people. So we want to say a very big thank you. And before we go off, we would like to ask on behalf of our audience how they can reach out to you. All right, thanks. Uh, always a pleasure, you know, jumping on a, on a conversation. So LinkedIn, I think is, you know, a, a great way um, to, to look at the, you know, the updates on Well I Health and the official stuff. 
And then for the kind of more unofficial, informal, and uh, trouble-seeking side, you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so on Twitter, I'm Doc Neto, D-O-C-N-E-T-O. But yeah, on LinkedIn, I'm Ikwame Neto. So it depends on, on the flavor you want. You choose the channel. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. I mean, thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Really appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing as much as you did. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And I hope you did enjoy that conversation. Quite interesting one. Do ensure that you continue to listen to our podcast and share as well with your colleagues and friends uh, future episodes and even previous ones on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, on every platform that you get your podcast. Right. And also don't forget to join the conversation on all of our social media platforms. We might have comments, reviews, as well as questions. Please do share on our LinkedIn page, on our Twitter page, as well as remember to follow us.